resurrected Savior. Brothers and sisters, as Christ is our witness, God's power to pardon is immeasurable. Therefore, proclaim this good news to the ends of the earth. Through the mercy of Christ, our sins are forgiven. The first scripture reading is from the book of Luke. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus is it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God.
first chapter of Acts. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about heaven. I had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with Of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom a bit to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let us stand and sing number 173, Christ whose glory fills the sky. But the most exciting 
um, part of our two weeks away was attending our son Luke's graduation from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. It was a wonderful event and we were, of course, brimming with pride. Graduations are always pivotal events. Everything about them represents a strong hope for the future. From the very first trumpet blast of pomp and circumstance to the ritual of turning a tassel, there is this sense of accomplishment and new beginning pervasive in the air. While we were there, we enjoyed watching large families carrying balloons and flowers and personalized signs that read things like, way to go, Stephen, or the tassel is worth the hassle. <laughs> we discovered a natural camaraderie among parents who, though strangers in that arena, are bound together in shared amazement at the transformation that has occurred over the last four years. One day your child is filling up the car with his few possessions, and four years now a man with a hopeful future. The commencement speeches encouraged the graduates to look back on their education with gratitude for the guidance that uh, was given to them by the professors and also the automatic deposits of their parents. <laughs> Another theme conveyed by the speakers was the confidence that the graduates are now ready to go and make great contributions in their chosen fields and in their communities. They're ready for commencement into this new adult phase of their lives. Well, it's serendipitous that the culmination of the Easter season comes at the same time as most graduations. For the ascension, perhaps the world's most spectacular graduation, comes 50 days after Easter. And indeed, both of the passages that we have heard today are stories of commencement, the graduation stories not only for Jesus, who literally ascends up into heaven, but just as importantly for the disciples. For as he goes up, they are to go out, to spread the news of God's love in the world. The passages for today take place in a field where the disciples watch Jesus, their teacher and their friend, separate from them. And the way he does it is spectacular. He ascends head first into heaven. But before he lifts off, Jesus offers a commencement address of sorts. And though it was brief, it covered a lot of ground. We have two accounts of it. In Luke, Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And the pinnacle of that teaching is that the disciples, those who are left with their feet firmly on the ground, are to now preach a change of heart and love for the forgiveness of sins. In the Acts passage, it puts it a little differently, but the charge is just the same. Jesus commissions them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, as teacher and example, Jesus has done what he was supposed to do. The disciples have received a three-year intensive on what life will be like in the kingdom of God. And all of their days with Jesus were spent preparing them to be like him, to be Jesus for the world. And his curriculum was really what most good teachers and most parents, for that matter, try to teach their children about being loving, responsible, faithful adults. He taught them the same lessons over and over again, in word and by example. He said to them, love one another, be humble. Practice forgiveness. Share what you have with other people. Don't put yourself first. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And many, many times he said to them, don't be afraid. And over and over again he modeled for them the life of faithful discipleship that God intended for them to embody. And then finally, on the day of their commencement, in trust and confidence and love, Jesus leaves them on their own to lead faithful and mature lives. Not ending that relationship, but going on to heaven where he will be able to then exercise 
his lordship and his power and his grace through all of time. Well, let's look at a moment at the ascension itself. With the books of Luke and Acts, we have really a two-part story. We have the gospel and then we have the sequel. And you know when you see a movie that's part of a series, how that first movie ends leaving with you with a sense of intrigue and anticipation? Well, that's exactly what happens at the end of Luke. Jesus Jesus' last words are, I am sending to you what my Father has promised. And then he goes up. And then the sequel comes out. And the author of Acts says, in the first book, I told you everything about Jesus, up to the point where he goes up. Well, here's what happens next. Now, if we were watching the sequel as a movie, the opening scene would show all of the disciples looking up as the feet of Jesus ascend into the clouds. And then the action continues when suddenly, out of nowhere, two men in white robes appear. The angel <coughs> Do you remember where? Was that the And as they were reeling at the realization that Jesus' body was gone, the women, like these disciples, were at a standstill. They didn't know what to do. And so these same angels appeared and asked them a question. They asked, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has been raised. And that question of the angels moves the women then to action. And they leave the tomb and they run and tell the disciples what they have seen. That's how it happens in Luke. But then we get to the sequel in Acts. And just as the puzzled disciples stood stunned as Jesus ascends into heaven, again, the angels appear from nowhere and remind them that while Jesus' feet have ascended into heaven, theirs have not. And they actually now have work to do. And that interruption in the disciples' stupor is actually the beginning then of the work of the church. So these two mystery angels are really <coughs> characters. In, in film, such characters appear only briefly, and they're always there for a special purpose. You know how in Hitchcock movies, the director himself often makes cameo appearances. Well, in Luke and Acts, the purpose of these cameo appearances show that God is still the director in this ongoing story. And the angel's role is to move the action forward at a point where the human characters appear stuck or lost. And the angel's function is almost like a divine kick in the pants to keep the disciples moving the story forward. The angel's presence is what makes the ending of Jesus' story the new beginning of God's unfolding story. And so the ascension is not really a record about how Jesus went to heaven and left us. It's much more a story of how his rising initiated the time when the church was charged then with being the living vital witness to God's saving grace and love. Well, both of these texts end in a similar fashion. Each includes a promise and then some parting words. In Luke, Jesus sums up his teaching and then makes the promise that the disciples are going to be clothed from power, with power from on high. And then he ascends to heaven and the disciples go to Jerusalem, rejoicing and praising God. In Acts, the sequel, we are left with more of a sense of anticipation for the disciples having witnessed Jesus go up to heaven are told by angels to return to the upper room and wait for the arrival of the Holy Spirit who will come down the same way that Jesus went up. The promise there is that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's talking about Pentecost. In both stories, the promise is the same. The Spirit of God will be with them soon. Well, Mary Wright Edelman <clears throat> wrote a wonderful book for her children entitled The Measure of Our Success. It was a gift to them, a repository of her mother wisdom. It makes a great graduation gift also because it speaks of the hope and dreams 
that we wish for young people as they take their place in the adult world. Part of the book is a letter in which Edelman lists the 25 lessons that she wants her children to learn in life. I can't list all 25, but they include such loving advice as slow down and live. You alone are in charge of your attitude. Don't ever stop learning and improving your mind. And take parenting and family life seriously. But it's the 25th one that I want to leave with you today because it's so much like what Jesus had been telling his disciples before he ascended into heaven. It's sort of Edelman's low and I am with you always, even to the end of the age promise. And so in this commencement-like speech to her three children, she wrote, our home remains as you go out to serve and conquer the world. And know I always follow you wherever you go, in spirit, in prayer, and in love. You are never alone. That's just like the Ascension promise. We are never alone. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Having heard, let us now stand together and declare together our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He descended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, We move together now to a time of prayer, and as we sing together into this time of prayer, you're invited to light a candle that might symbolize your prayer. Through the power of your spirit. 
As we worship this day in freedom, we're reminded that freedom has a cost. And we take time today to lift up the grieving hearts of those for whom Memorial Day is more than a mere division, diversion from work, but is instead a painful time of reflection and bereavement. And we honor their memory, dear Lord, with a sincere pledge, pledge to seek peace and justice through nonviolent solutions to conflict. We pray for those most recent rem reminders of the tragedy and insanity of war, innocent lives of children and their parents in Manchester, and those on pilgrimage who were murdered in Egypt. We pray for the safety of those entering military service and all who currently serve, bring healing for the many returning from combat with wounded bodies and minds injured by sights and sounds of war. Prayers also extend great comforter to those who wait daily for the precious moment of reunion with a different, distant family member. God of healing, we lift to you aloud now all those we know and love who struggle with illness. present with them and those who love and care for them, ease their pain and restore their spirits. And we especially lift to you this day, Pam Meisner and Lon Wallace, and may the quilts offered this day bring them comfort and restoration. We also lift to you those who would join our fellowship this morning, Pat and Larry Fox, Betty Tuckett, Bobby Pendleton, Denise Shute. May they grow in our presence and may they offer are their service to you through our community. Make us bearers of peace and reconciliation to all your creation, for yours is the love in which we live, move, and have our being that redeems us all through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And may the sound of the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Also in response, we give of our time, our talents, and our resources. Ushers, will you receive this morning's tithes and offerings, please? Thank you. 
O God, of all glory and majesty, we give you thanks for the gift of our Son and his power at work in our lives through our grace. Bless these offerings for the benefits they afford in bringing life to others in your name. Bless our lives. Our closing hymn is number 413, A Charge.
love it because you're all of those things. Thank you. I love it. Thank <laughs> you. 
down and do each of you and tell the congregation your name. All right? And then they'll welcome you again and give you your entire seats. And at the end of the service, during the hymn, Greg will come and help you out. And then you can stand up there for a minute. We need a while. I've also wanted to. Oh, it's, uh, no. Um, we have some in our. Yes. Oh, good.
Good morning. It's my joy to welcome all of you to worship this morning. A special word of greeting to those of you who are guests here today. We are especially glad that you're here as we together enjoy and, and worship together on this ascension on Sunday. I invite you to register your attendance on the cards that are included in your order of service. We will then collect those later in the service. We have a lot of announcements today, and I mean a lot. So, um, all good, though. The first one is, uh, I'd like to begin by inviting you uh, to uh, the All Church Blue Out that's going to take place next week following uh, second service. This is our annual event this year. It has a Hawaiian theme. Now, um, you also know very well that next week is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church. And in the past, we have dressed in fire colors of orange, yellow, red, and blue. Uh, we're going to uh, take Pentecost to Hawaii this next week, and so you're invited to dress uh, in, in Hawaiian garb. Uh, no bathing suits, please. Uh, we hope you will do that. Our uh, picnic and our party takes place following second service in the fellowship hall, and you are all invited. I'd like to invite uh, Rick Doremus, Chair of Trustees, to come forward for uh, an announcement. Uh, Martha asked me to uh, share with you what we did this week. And what we did this week is we painted the interior of the sanctuary. Wow. You may or may not have noticed it, but uh, <laughs> we did paint it. Um, to tell you the truth, it took 50 gallons of paint to have this place painted. Now, I personally didn't do any painting, I have to admit that, nor did any of our volunteers, but we hired a company to do the painting. However, we had a huge scaffold here. We had to, we moved all the pews. We had to bolt all the pews, move them to the sides, and then bring the scaffolding in, which went up. It just cleared underneath the beams. That's how high it was. So they could get up and paint everything up there. Um, and I had promised Martha we'd have it finished for today. Thursday, I brought her in here and I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> and she says, don't worry. Because we can't get the scaffolding out, put it up here. And she had some plan of how she was going to incorporate that in her service. In her sermon. And then she was disappointed yesterday when I told her, don't worry about it. I got it out. So anyway, I want to let you know that we did do it. And I want to tell you also that they spent about 156 man hours of time in here. They were working nonstop from Monday till 5.30 Friday afternoon. And they'll be back to do some touch-up work this week. Um, but we also have eight guys that helped me. And I just wanted to mention their names. There's Greg Doucette, Greg Edmonds, Kichi Kajuda, Bill Miller, Vance Mills, Carl Ports, Stan Schroeder, and Mark Sagal. And without their help, this is going to It's finished, almost. We're glad to have it done. And, and I think the person we need to thank the most is Rick, who spent more hours. Than <laughs> it was just such a <clears throat> to have this painted. Now I'd like Jan Pruitt, Chair of Staff Parish Relations Committee, to come forward. This is all good news. Relax. Everybody relax. Um, during the last year, the Staff Parish Relations Committee and Reverend Wingfield have been in conversation um, about how to best meet the needs of our growing youth and children ministry and also for the staff uh, to be able to use their talents the best. Since then, she requested from the district superintendent the opportunity to bring on an additional part-time associate minister in the area of children, youth, and family ministries. In support of this bold move, Bishop Haya has appointed Reverend Diane uh, Davis to serve at San Carlos UMC as associate minister of children, youth, and family ministries beginning on July 1st. On behalf of the bishop, the district superintendent has sent us a letter to announce this new appointment. Dear Jan and the congregation of San Carlos UMC, 
On behalf of Bishop Grant Hagia and his cabinet, I share with you that after much prayer and consultation, it is Bishop Grant Hagia's intent to appoint Pastor Diane Davis to serve as part-time associate pastor on staff at San Carlos UMC, effective July 1, 2017. Pastor Diane is a deacon with rich experience in developing ministries that help children, youth, and adults grow in their faith. Pastor Diane will work with Pastor Martha on a smooth transition as she joins the San Carlos UMC ministry. Bishop, I thank you for the great insights and prayers your SPRC has offered through this process, and I anticipate even greater things from your congregation as we journey forward. In ministry together, Reverend John Farley, District Superintendent, South District. Now, before you get excited, what does this mean to the current staff members? As of July 1st, some current staff members will assume new responsibilities. Kim Ports will take over membership ministries and will launch a new social justice ministry while continuing to provide IT support for the church and preschool. Reverend Greg Ledoux continues as Associate Minister of Pastoral Care and Adult Studies. David Bradley will have responsibility for the senior high school ministry. You will find the staff reconfiguration is further detailed in Reverend Wingfield's column in the Good News that comes out this Tuesday. Um, as soon as uh, Reverend Davis joins us, we'll definitely introduce her to you, but I want you to know that over the last few years she has been a mentor to Kim, and so she is very much well received and will be an integral part of our group very soon. So, can you come up here a second? The other good news is another event that we want to celebrate today is that Kim Ports, who is going to seminary and is a candidate for ministry from our congregation, has passed an important milestone in her path towards ordination. Kim passed her certification papers and interview with the South District Board of Ordained Ministry last week, and she is now a certified candidate for ministry. We are currently proud of her and congratulate her for approaching a significant step towards ordination. Her certification for candidacy. So uh, we are. <laughs>
sing songs of praise. For God reigns over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout. Sound the trumpets and sing songs of praise. Brothers and sisters, as Christ is our witness, God's power to pardon is immeasurable. Therefore, pro proclaim this good news to the ends of the earth. Through the mercy of Christ, our sins are forgiven. And now it's time for the children to come forward for moments with children. Wonderful work with all of you, and I'm very happy for that. 
and I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be around, and I would love a Miss Kim hug from time to time. All right? And in our story that the grown-ups are going to be learning and that I'm going to be teaching in Sunday school, it's a time of change. And this change is Jesus ascending to heaven and the disciples standing around going, what do we do now? And, and they're supposed to go and tell people about Jesus. And now that's what we're doing all the time. We show people the love of Jesus whenever we can. Say it there. Dear God, Dear thanks for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to teach us, to love us, and to save us. In Jesus' name, amen. from the book of Luke. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised, to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Oh, oh, oh. 
chapter of Acts. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let us stand and sing together, Christ whose glory fills the sky, number 173. <laughs>
brimming with pride. Graduations are always pivotal events. Everything about them represents hope for the future. From the first trumpet blast of pomp and circumstance to the ritual of turning a tassel, there is this sense of accomplishment as well as new beginning right in the air. While we were there, we enjoyed watching large families carrying balloons and flowers and personalized signs that read things like, way to go, Stephen, or the tassel's worth the hassle. <laughs> We discovered a natural camaraderie among parents who, though strangers in that arena, were bound together in shared amazement at the transformation that had occurred over the last four years. For one day, your child fills up the car with all of his possessions, and four years later, that same person processes in cap and gown, now a man, with a hopeful future. The commencement speeches encourage the graduates to look back on their education with gratitude for both the guidance of their professors as well as the automatic deposits of their parents. <laughs> Another theme conveyed by the speakers was the confidence that the graduates are now ready to go and make great contributions in their chosen fields and in their communities. They were ready for commencement into this new adult phase of their lives. What's most serendipitous, really, that the culmination of the Easter season comes at the same time as most graduations. For the Ascension, perhaps the world's most spectacular graduation, occurs 50 days after Easter. And indeed, both of the passages that we have heard today are stories of commencement. Their graduation stories, not only for Jesus into heaven, but just as importantly for the disciples. For as he goes up, they are to go out to spread the news of God's love in the world. Well, the passages for today take place in a field as the disciples watch Jesus, their teacher and friend, separate from them. And the way he does this is spectacular. He ascends headfirst into heaven. But before he lifts off, he offers a, a brief commencement address of sorts. And, it, and though it was brief, it covered a lot of ground. We have today two accounts of it. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And the pinnacle of that teaching is that the disciples, those who are left with their feet firmly on the ground, are the ones who now are to preach a change of heart and love for the forgiveness of sins. And then in the Acts passage, it's put a little differently, but the charge is just the same. Jesus commissions them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so as, te as teacher and example, Jesus has done what he was supposed to do. The disciples have received a three-year intensive on what life will be like in the kingdom of God. And all of their days with Jesus were spent preparing them to be like him, to be Jesus for the world. And his curriculum was really what most good teachers, and, and I think most parents for that matter, try to teach their children about being loving, responsible, faithful adults. He taught them the same lessons over and over again in word and by example. Among them, he told them, love one another, be humble, practice forgiveness, share with others what you have. Don't put yourself first. Love God with all your heart and soul and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And many times he told them, do not be afraid. And so over and over again, Jesus modeled the life of faithful discipleship that God had And then finally, Lordship 
his power, and his grace for all of time. So let, let's look a moment at the ascension itself. With the books of Luke and Acts, we have really a two-part story. We have the gospel, and then we have the sequel. You know when you see a movie that's part of a series, how the first movie ends, leaving you with a sense of intrigue and anticipation? Well, that is what happens at the end of Luke. Jesus' last words are, I am sending to you what my Father has promised. And then he goes up. And then the sequel comes out. And the same author of Acts says, in the first book, I told you everything about Jesus up to the point where he goes up. Well, here's what happens next. And so if we were watching this sequel as a movie, the opening scene would show all the disciples looking up at the feet of Jesus as he ascends into the clouds. And then the action continues when suddenly out of nowhere, two men in white robes appear to the disciples. Now we have seen these angels before. Do you remember? How about on the tomb on Easter morning? For in Luke, these two mystery guests appeared to the women who went to the tomb. And when they were reeling at the realization that Jesus' body was gone, these women were at a standstill. They didn't know what to do. And at that moment then, these same angels appeared, and they asked them a question. They asked, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but he has been raised. And that question of the angels then moves the women to take action. They leave the tomb and they run to tell the disciples what they've seen. That's how it happens in Luke. And then we get to the sequel in Acts. And just as the puzzled disciples stand stunned as Jesus ascends into heaven, again, the angels appear from nowhere and remind them that while Jesus' feet have ascended to heaven, theirs have not. And they now have work to do. And this interruption of the disciples' stupor is actually the beginning of the work of the church. These two mystery angels are, are really cameo characters then. In films, such characters appear only briefly and always for special purpose. You know how made cameo appearances. But in Luke show that God is still the director of the and the angel's role is to move the action forward at a point where the human characters appear stuck or lost. The angels function almost like a divine kick in the pants to keep the disciples moving forward. Well, the angel's presence is what makes the ending of Jesus' story the beginning of the new part of God's story. The ascension itself is, is not a record so much about how Jesus went to heaven and left us. It is a story of how his rising initiated the time when the church was charged <coughs> with being the living, vital witness to God's saving grace and love. Well, both of these texts end in a similar fashion as well. Each includes a promise and then some parting words. In Luke, Jesus sums up his teachings and then makes the promise that the disciples will be clothed with power from on high. And then he ascends to heaven and the disciples go into Jerusalem rejoicing and praising God. In Acts, the sequel, we are left with more of a sense of anticipation. For the disciples having witnessed Jesus going up into heaven are told by the angels now to return to the upper room and wait for the arrival of the Holy Spirit who will come down the same way Jesus just went up. And that promise there was that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In both stories, the promise is the same, that the Spirit of God will be with them soon. Mary and Wright Edelman wrote a wonderful book for her children entitled The Measure of Our Success. It was a gift to them, uh, really a repository of her mother wisdom. It makes a great graduation gift. 
as it speaks of the hopes and dreams that we wish for young people as they take their place in the adult world. Part of the book is a letter in which Edelman lists the 25 lessons that she wants her own children to learn in life. I'm not gonna list all of them, but they include such loving advice as slow down and live. You are in charge of your own attitude. Don't ever stop learning and improving your mind and take parenting and family life seriously. But it's the 25th one that I want to leave with you today because it's so much like what Jesus had been telling his disciples right before he ascended to heaven. It's sort of Edelman's low I am with you always, even to the end of the age promise. In this commencement-like speech to her three children, she wrote, our home remains as you go out to serve and conquer the world. And know I always follow you wherever you go, in spirit, in prayer, and in love. You are never alone. That's just like the ascension promise. That wherever we go and however we choose to live out this call to proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins, we are never alone. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. It's our joy this morning to receive new members into this fellowship. So as you turn in your uh, hymnal to page 33, I invite these people to receive uh, to come forward at this time. baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And through confirmation and the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptisms, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. And so to you who are to be received this day, on behalf of the whole church, accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Congregation, I would ask you, do you as Christ's body of the church reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Yeah. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? Do you believe in 
the Holy Spirit.
to seek peace and justice through nonviolent solutions to conflict. We pray for those most recent reminders of the tragedy and insanity of war, innocent lives of children and their parents in Manchester, and those on pilgrimage who were murdered in Egypt. We pray this day for the safety of all those in military service. And we pray that you would bring healing for the many returning from combat with wounded bodies and minds, injured by the sight and sounds of war. And our prayers extend, gracious God, to those who wait daily for that precious moment of reunion with a distant family member. God of healing, we lift to you aloud now all those we know and love who struggle with illness or infirmity of body, mind, or spirit. Be present with them as we lift them to you for your love and care. Hear our prayers. We especially lift to you this day, Pam Meissner and Lon Wallace. May the quilts offered this day bring them comfort to body and soul. And we take a moment now to lift to you those who have joined our fellowship. Pat and Larry Fox, Betty Tuckett, Bobby Pendleton, Denise Shute. May they, <clears throat> excuse me, may they grow in our presence and may we offer them a place to be of service to you. Make us bearers of peace and reconciliation to all your creation. For yours is the love in which we move and live and have our being, and that redeems us all through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Thank you. 
closing hymn, A Charge to Keep, I have number 413. <laughs>